Top stories tonight. Governors want each state to determine new minimum wage. CBN Governor Olaemi Kadoso declares end to Naira devaluation panic. Health authorities confirm two deaths from cholera outbreak in River State. Mauritania's President El Ghazani promises to respect poll outcome. Thank you for joining us. I am Dakbo Adigbuye. Let's begin by telling you that governors from the southern part of Nigeria and other ages of the Southern Governors Forum have called for the consideration of the ability of each state to pay the new minimum wage. Their call came as the Nigerian Governors Forum said it will continue to engage stakeholders to reach a mutually agreeable solution to the minimum wage crisis. This is as Organized labor on Thursday raised alarm that both public and private sector workers were becoming restive over delay in concluding the negotiation and we are pushing labor leaders to declare industrial action to quicken the process. The governors in a 16-point communique also advocated that each state be allowed to negotiate the new wage with the labor unions. In the meantime, the Nigeria Labour Congress has warned state governors against attempting to unilaterally determine the minimum wage, stating that it is a collective agreement that ensures a minimum standard of living for workers. The NLC spokesperson, Besson Okpa, made this known in a statement on Friday. The Congress emphasized that the national minimum wage is not the same as individual state per structures, which already reflect each state's unique financial capabilities. Instead, it represents a national wage floor, below which no worker should be paid. They cautioned that allowing governors to pay workers whatever they deem fit will negate this principle and threaten the welfare of Nigerian workers and the national economy. To discuss this, I'm joined on the news by public affairs analyst Ahmed Husseini. Thank you for your time on the news, Ahmed, and uh, let's get straight to it. Uh, what is your stance on the recent calls by some state governors to pay a reduced minimum wage? Hello, thank you. Um, uh, I think um, most of those governors, uh, we, I agree with one part of the argument and I dis disagree with the other part. I agree with the part that says the state should be allowed to pay based on their ability to pay, but that should not be below the federal minimum wage. Because if you look at what is obtainable in the U.S. that we are always quick to give example of, um, usually the federal minimum wage is about $7.25 and states cannot go below that. So you can see states actually matching that, states like Alabama and other states like Washington, New York, and even California going as high as $16 per hour. So if states can be allowed to actually pay on the ability, but it should not go below the federal minimum wage. The federal minimum wage, I agree with the Labor Congress uh, position, would be actually the floor, not the ceiling. I also understand that some argue that the national minimum wage does not reflect the country's economic reality. How do you respond to this? Well, I think um, uh, I don't agree with that because, uh, yeah, I, I actually, if the world government is offering around 62,000 naira, you know, per month, is what governors are claiming they cannot be able to match, then I don't agree that it is actually in a way inconsistent with our economic realities because Nigerian workers want to see more action on the part of, you know, the ruling class, like what they have been, what are they currently doing, you know, to cut on their own expenditure, what kind of sacrifices, you know, are our leaders making in order to ensure that, you know, they are also, you know, keeping their own luxury and luxurious lifestyle in tandem with the economic reality of the country. Because you cannot ask Nigerian workers who are actually, you know, earning or among, you know, at the lowest rung of the economic ladder. You cannot ask them to make sacrifices while the leadership continues, you know, to actually wallow in luxuries and profligacy and continue to, you know, um, enjoy all the parts of their offices without making any sacrifice. There are a lot of, you know, frivolous expenditures on the parts of the ruling class, you know, buying the present a new jet, you know, spending a lot of money constructing, you know, presidential policies and all that. But then 
you are asking Nigerian workers to sacrifice. I don't agree with that. I don't think that's, that's inconsistent with our economic reality. What is inconsistent with our economic reality is the tendency of the ruling class to actually ignore the suffering of the masses while continuing to enjoy the luxuries of their offices. Hmm. Now, let's talk about uh, steps that can be taken or, uh, by the NLC to engage with state governments and other stakeholders to ensure uh, that the implementation of a uniform a national minimum wage. What, what do you think the NLC can further do to sort of push this? this? The, the NLC does not have the capacity to actually enforce or impose minimum wage on the state. I think it is the federal government that somehow have the capacity, but also the federal government also will need you know, the backing of the National Assembly because any unilateral action by the federal government to impose minimum wage on the state will actually be rejected, but it will actually be opposed or resisted by the government, or sorry, by the state government, and that means we will end up you know, having some litigation up to the Supreme Court. But if the presidency or the federal government can be able to actually co-opt or convince the National Assembly to make some legislation that can be binding to state, on, to state government, then we were able to have some form of, you know, conformity with the federal minimum wage, you know, by the state governments. But anything other than that, the Labor Congress does not have that capacity. And it also depends on the state. There are states where labor agitations are actually intense, and the, the labor movement can be able to, you know, actually exact some political prize on, on the government in power. But there are other states that the labor movement is merely the extension of, you know, the government in power, and they cannot be able to do anything to force the government to actually look after the welfare of Nigerian workers in their respective states. All right. Uh, thank you for your time on the news. Ahmed Hosseini. Now, it's the pleasure, Academic thanks. Staff Union of Universities has threatened to proceed and strike if government fails to clear the salary of rares owed lecturers as well as address other challenges facing university education in the country at the expiration of the two weeks ultimatum given to the federal and state governments. Leading a protest match at Abia State University, Uturu, coordinator of the Calabas Zone of ASU called on Governor Alex Arti to abolish the single treasury account introduced in the state. New Central's Chinwe Ugele tells us more. Universities in the Calabar zone marched peacefully around Abia State University, Uturu, chanting songs of solidarity and voicing their rejection of certain policies. The zonal coordinator of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, Calabar Zone, Happiness Uduk, declared that numerous challenges hindering the growth of tertiary education in the zone must be addressed within two weeks. ASU is a voice of the common man saying no to government. Make tertiary education affordable for the children of the poor. Make tertiary education attractive and conducive. And if government refuses to do this, we are asking that you hold government responsible and not ASU. ASU Chairman, Abia State University, Uturu Dr. Chidimba, also called on Governor Alex Oti to boost the university's funding and abolish the single treasury account system. Recently, the state's finance commissioner, Mike Abara, announced that the government has taken full control of the university's financial operations, eliminating the need for any further subventions. If I pay your salaries, take care of all your expenses as an overhead and everything, definitely you will not have control of the internally generated revenue any longer. The lecturers also want the federal and state governments to appoint university council members as well as increase the remuneration of university workers. Regarding the alleged unpaid salaries of university staff, the union leaders insisted that the government has not fulfilled its payment obligations. So we are requesting the Abia State Governor to immediately pay our members their 11 month old salaries. We are not negotiating any part of that salary for anything because we have worked, we have taught students, we have examined students, some of whom have graduated. The union leaders also criticized the alleged excessive taxation and the unchecked increase in the number of universities. 
highlighting the severe underfunding of current federal and state universities. In Umahafanyu Central, Chinwe Ugele. Goods and properties worth over 3 billion naira have been destroyed at the fire which hit the popular Kado market in Abuja. The market, less than an hour from the city centre, raged from late Thursday night till the early hours of Friday morning and could not be stopped by the fire service. Officials of the market say over 3,000 traders and artisans were affected in, by the inferno. News Central's Emmanuel Bagudu tells us more. This is the aftermath of the devastating inferno that happened yesterday in Karu Market, located here at the Abuja Municipal Area Council of the FCT. For now, traders are gathering the pieces of the remains of their businesses and expressing their disappointment in authorities because they say the inferno is preventable. <laughs> It was all sorrow and tears as traders at the popular Karu market appeared very early to count their losses. With confusion on their faces and many trying to salvage the little that can be saved from the aftermath of the fire, some accused government officials of not acting fast enough to minimize the losses incurred from the fire. Even those fire services will come, they, even allow, they, they did not allow them to quench it for the first time. It's the only beggar will come at last. That quench all the things that you see. Near our young Yankin up and said, and what are Uku? They are the Dantana, our Janada, and in a cast work at Dunkadan. No markers, what are the Tacha, the Mena Chonkuma, and Atakashamata, and Yokoji, and Kakashaman Amatani Agarum. Most of the people that rushed to this place earlier could not be able to enter this uh, market just because the security locks all the whole gate and a few people to enter. Men of us, where they are the same. Now, Guru me, go with Lapo, now with the collect. When we sell, we buy and we pay. And now, everything we buy, don't close, don't burn, and no way to get that money again. May government help us. May they help us with a bag. Nobody say we want another thing, may they help us. As government officials begin to arrive, the senator representing the Federal Capital Territory was the first on the scene, followed by President Bola Tinibu's senior special assistant on humanitarian affairs and poverty alleviation. For us, all of getting Nigeria to be what we want is a collective thing. You, me, everybody, leaders as well as people. Do you understand? You can't, the country we want will not happen in a vacuum. We all have to join hands and do build that nation that we all aspire to be. So in the course of what we have lost in this World I Fire outbreak yesterday, we lost more than 3.5 billion naira. One of my neighbors the day before yesterday, he came back with three trucks of rice. And you all of us know the cost of one bag of rice in this country now. On behalf of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, we are here to sympathize with the people of Karo local government and their families, especially those that were affected by the fire incidents. Last night, the government is fully aware and cares. I've seen the situation is worse. I will take the message back. This has not affected the people of Cairo only, but the country at large. With millions of naira lost in this inferno, it is hoped that the plea made by these traders will be heard by relevant authorities to prevent future occurrence. In Abuja, for New Central, I'm Emmanuel Bagudu. Coming up on the news, health authorities confirm two deaths from cholera outbreak in River State. We have details of this and more after now. If you have just joined us, you're watching tonight. A reminder of our top stories. Governors want each state to determine new minimum wage. CBN Governor Olaemi Kadoso declares end to Naira devaluation panic. Health authorities confirm two deaths from cholera outbreak in River State. Mauritania's president promises to respect poll outcome. 
Let's move to business-related matters where the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Olaemi Kadoso, has declared an end to the recent panic over the Naira devaluation, attributing the stabilization to restored liquidity in the market. The CBN governor highlighted a significant improvement in market conditions, saying Nigeria's total foreign exchange inflow reached $24 billion in the first quarter of the year. He emphasized that the nation's financial challenges were temporarily and expressed confidence in the recent policy efforts by fiscal authorities to boost revenues and the tax to gross domestic product uh, ratio. To discuss this, I'm joined by chartered accountant Akin Fatuke. Akin, thank you for joining me on the news. Let's get straight to it. The CBN governor has declared an end to the recent panic over the Naira devaluation, attributing the stabilization to restored liquidity in the market. What are your thoughts on this? My thoughts are very simple. The CBN governor is doing what needs to be done. By the way, um, that we well, good evening and good evening to Nigerians. Mm. Um, he is obviously he is obviously trying to engender hope and coming back. To let Nigerians know that uh, some of the reforms uh, that uh, have been happening on the monetary side is beginning to yield fruits. Uh, so, what else do you expect? Um, the central bank governor that has been working virtually around the clock on the one side that we have, and um, looking at the scorecard for the first quarter, I'm saying at 24 billion. That's, that's, that's great. Very, well, very great news. Yeah, I'll but just, uh, just a quick follow-up to that. In again. reality, just a quick follow-up to that, apologies. But in reality, is that the situation? Oh, yes. First contact on four billion, yes. Except that um, I also know that um, it can be a perfect situation. I know the effects coming in from the diaspora also have a bit one or two ways of of leakages uh, are we gathering or should we not be comparing what we have here into the more glorious age uh, that we had when fdi was flowing in like they say downtown yafun yafun but the economic condition and the economic environment that we found ourselves now is such that we are coming from memoirs so i i, I believe that um, it can be done better, especially if you consider the fact that most um, sub-Saharan African countries are now getting to the kind of peonage that um, is linked to IMF, IMF and conditionalities. Nigeria is learning, open our eyes very wide and learning what is happening to Kenya. But again, uh, Dr. Paul, now, when, when you ask me that question, that is that really what is happening? Uh, I begin to smell a little bit of a rat because I think to have asked the right question. Uh, are we really doing the right thing? Do we have a gendered trust in the system? Do we still have a, a, a revenue generation problem? Yes. Do we still have spending problem? Yes. Are we budgeting all right? Do we have carrying the whole of the country all, all around? Uh, but I am I am happy that one, uh, I mean, the CBN governor has lived to his promise to play all outstanding um, obligations to the airlines, at least effectively the one that have been audited. I'm also happy that uh, it's not been fixed in one direction. Uh, I mean, you know, quite a number of policy options uh, getting across. I'm so happy uh, that, well, that we have a CBN governor who has decided to face his, his, his job very, very squarely. Mm. Um, I have not heard that um, he wants to be president of Nigeria and that, uh, he, I mean, if you understand what I'm trying to say there. Well, well, but, okay, but, regulation, but, regulation, regulation, regulation was, mm. is likely to be his focus. But the other side still has to work. Uh, on the physical side, he's speaking about the physical why, side. Why and also cannot speak for the physical side. Yeah. Okay. Why why I asked all of that is because I mean Nigerians are still complaining uh, about uh, the cost of living itself. Talking about um, you know even the cost of doing business. We are seeing large companies you know exit the country. Uh, maybe not in droves, but um, I mean in a very long time the exodus has been quite you know alarming. But my question is this, what are the short-term and long-term economic impacts of 
uh, improved liquidity, particularly on the Nigerian economy, such that it can also you know, boost investor confidence? In the short term, little takes here and there to begin to allow governance in all aspects of um, our endeavor to engender trust uh, for the physical side to begin to speak and not um, just speak because we want to speak. Uh, I want to begin to see action. Um, in the medium term, also, I do not see a situation where we are going to get a quick turnaround per se, but in the long term, we can be looking at inflation. We can be looking at the supply side because the liquidity thing that we are talking about, can, can we begin to fix um, the supply side from the physical um, aspect? Can we? Therefore, my dear friend and um, brother who is looking at our tax regime, now harmonize tax in such a way that we don't have double transition. And also at a time when, uh, like you said, you know, cost of living is high, can we begin to now um, stagger this in a little bit of a direction? Most importantly, that what to me is that the executive, the executive must now begin to show the kind of example that we expect to see, not the discordant voices I think I'm hearing mm. as regards uh, wanting to get uh, a presidential uh, plane and all that, minimum wage, we are still not going the right direction. All this, this engender trust. So for me, I think the long-term implication will be stability in the microeconomic environment. People, SMEs, can now begin to now, I mean, assess funds in, in a better way. Mm. Not necessarily by throwing funds, because I see that uh, after the CDN governor spoke, uh, the president of the, of the Federal Republic also now came and was appealing to governors. Uh, I do not think appeal will work it. We need to work the structures. We need to All begin right. to lead, for example. And by the time we begin to do this, uh, trust is going to be engendered, but we need to change the economic, physical landscape. Call it restructuring, call it changing the concept, but uh, the situation where we're still not looking directly at the um, security challenges that we have, I mean, don't right. forget about that. Uh, uh, all right, Akin, because we press for time, uh, let's talk about uh, the predictions for the Naira's performance in the coming months considering you know this uh, current development what do you see happening i see uh, mr kadosu as a headmaster i see him as a conservative person for him to have gone to bloomberg and made fundamental statements uh, again we'll see how things go he's just spoken about the first quarter i have a feel that he's beginning to see numbers coming in for um Okay, April, maybe for Bay, and then we can rack up for June. Seeing that the leakages are, are, are dwindling, I foresee a situation where in this short term, if the economy, and that is it, the what if, rest ipso facto, given the, all the facts that we have, and all things being equal, satellite variables, everything begin to work in some right direction in the medium term, we are going to see a bit of a stability of looking at the liquidity coming in and then looking at the demand side if we decide to cut quote according to plot and begin to see what happened in Kenya that should not also happen to us. We do not wait until when we get there. I'll begin to find a way that hopefully with what the governments are saying, they begin to lead by example so they can at least puts behind us this minimum wage or no minimum wage, um, you know, uh, portfolio. But setting those examples, FX, in accordance to what IMF and what uh, Bloomberg is saying, that towards the end of the of, of the year, which to me looks like a bit of a long term, okay. should be traded at 1.4, 1.5, 1.4. For the planning purposes, I think it's going um, to, to really all go well. All right. In the long term, I see the Nigerian economy. If we do not continue to see the capital flight that we see, yeah, we have capital flights and it's being replaced here and there. I will bring to begin to bring the confidence into the economy. Look, uh, Dakbo, the truth of the matter is that for us to move in the nice direction, we must continue to produce.
must make sure that our appetite for imported goods right from the top um, is curtailed and we begin to see right. that uh, people get back to the farms and do what they need to do and take care of security too. All right, Akin Fatuka, thank you so much for your contribution on the news at this time. Always a pleasure, Dako. Thanks for having me. All right. Let's also tell you that Nigeria's Vice President, Kashim Shatima, has urged stakeholders to build a business environment that fosters innovation, creativity, and productivity, aligned with President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's eight-point agenda. He also implored members of the Presidential Enabling Business Environment Council as well as ministries, departments, and agencies to prioritize the dreams of all Nigerians who aspire to grow their businesses. Shatima, during the council's town hall meeting held at the banquet hall of the presidential villa Abuja, noted that the success is not merely a matter of policy, but is measured by its impact from the small-time trader to Kafanchan, in Kafanchan to the large corporation on Lagos Island. Let's move to health matters now. We are following the recent outbreak of cholera in River State. Two deaths have been confirmed, while 16 persons reportedly survived the disease. The state health commissioner uh, disclosed this during a state broadcast in Podakot, the state capital. Now, New Central's Austin Azu tells us more. In response to the recent cholera outbreak in Nigeria, several states are intensifying efforts to educate citizens about its dangers and implement strategies to halt its spread. River State Health Commissioner says in the last four weeks, two fatalities have been reported in Adonia local government area, attributing the death to symptoms strongly indicative of cholera. While there are currently no active cholera cases in the state, the health commissioner emphasized the importance of maintaining good hygiene among residents. Cholera remains a major public health concern, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Nigeria and indeed River State have not been spared from sporadic cases of especially short-lived rural outbreaks. Regarding the past four weeks in the state, we have had about 16 suspected cases of acute watery diarrhea across three communities in coastal areas of Andoni local government area, with two associated deaths. The scenario was rapidly resolved, and two samples tested positive for cholera by screening tool with a rapid diagnostic test kit. River State is the first state in south-south Nigeria to have recorded the outbreak of cholera and casualties in the region. In Port Harcourt, for News Central, Austin, Azul. Agricultural experts in Nigeria have called on citizens to leverage on the potential of technology to drive famine and food production across Africa. This was during the grand finale of the Ayute Challenge in Abuja, the nation's capital. The event, which brought together leading agrotech innovators showcasing groundbreaking solutions, is aimed at revolutionizing both Nigeria and Africa's agricultural landscape. New Central's Joshua Imarai tells us more. At this event are industry insiders in technology and agriculture who have come together to find solutions to the challenges facing agriculture and food production in the country. They say by leveraging the creativity and energy of young people, they can come up with groundbreaking solutions to improve farming and promote sustainable agricultural practices. We found a gap which, which is around leveraging youth and technology to address the problems of farmers. And we thought that Africa has a high demography of young people and we could leverage the creative minds of these young people to begin to create and encourage solutions that address the problems of farmers. It's a challenge actually that we started with, but we have gone beyond just the challenge now to including um, post-challenge activities, which includes uh, mentoring, and coaching and including incubation, you know, innovation, incubation and the like. So for us, uh, Ayute is a response 
you know, to our belief that youth and technology holds the key to uh, the transformation of agriculture in Nigeria and by extension Africa. At the event, stakeholders highlighted the significance of agriculture in driving economic growth and development. They say the sector has the potential to empower young Nigerians to become job creators rather than job seekers. Uh, with agriculture, you don't. Um, uh, young people can easily get into the process of job creation, the process of self-employment, um, put themselves together, do things like cooperatives, organize themselves into cooperatives. Uh, by so doing, they have they have the chance. They have um, they have they have the wherewithal to to access more funding from. Um, from programs such as this and um, from different participants of financial institutions. From the government, we can create the policies, but we cannot be the, the implementers. So we try to collaborate with stakeholders to make sure that uh, efforts like this you know, are being strengthened. As finalists of the IUT Challenge presented their innovative solution, the top three winners were awarded prize money to further develop their projects. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarai. The non-oil sector has massive potential for economic growth and diversification. An increase in the volume and value of exportable goods and services and the repatriation of export proceeds will enhance foreign exchange inflow into Nigeria and also assist in stabilizing the value of the Naira. However, the decline in non-oil exports have become worrisome. We, we are on an upward trajectory, trajectory now when it comes to the number of exports which are leaving the country compared to the years before it, 2020, early 2021. However, I think that continuity is very important. And um, like you use the word sustainability is key to ensure that the gains we can continue to maintain and perhaps surpass these gains. Um, ETO has come to stay. Uh, we're here in the industry now. Because being able to quickly evacuate cargoes that are going to the ports is very important in order to ensure that you are, you are taking benefit of the global market that is out there and the, the global demand for what Nigeria is able to produce. So having in place a system like ETO that ensures that the roads are free, that the ports are able to accept what they, uh, what they have capacity for, and that you control the traffic in such a way that those who need to move can move very quickly, and those who do not need to move do not clog the roads for those who don't need to move is very key. Find out more about how Nigeria's non-oil expert has fared and what needs to be done to sustain it. Watch Maritime Radar on Saturday at 7 p.m. and a repeat broadcast on Sunday at 1 p.m. on New Central TV. Still ahead, Mauritania's president promises to respect poll outcome. We have details of this and more after now. The news continues in North Africa, where incumbent Mauritanian President Mohamed Oud Sheikh El Ghazani says he will be the first to bow to the outcome of the elections when the results are out. The president, who made this known during the end of his campaign rally, said if re elected, it will repair all just injustices and heal all the wounds of the past. Seven candidates are running in Saturday's presidential poll, with the incumbent uh, the favorite to win a second term at the head of the vast West African nation. Up next is business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Welcome to business news. We begin in Nigeria, where Emomotimi Agama, the Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission, has emphasized the potential of cryptocurrency to benefit the country's unbanked population. 
at the annual conference of the Association of Capital Market Academics of Nigeria, Agama projected that Nigeria's cryptocurrency market would reach $52.5 billion by 2028, with the current market already valued at over $400 million. Agama highlighted that approximately 33.4% of Nigerians own or use cryptocurrencies, offering an opportunity to extend financial services to the unbanked population. Total Energies, in partnership with the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, has made a final investment decision, FID, to develop the better gas field in Nigeria's OML58 onshore license. OML58 currently has the Obagi oil field and the Bewa gas and condensate field in production. The Obeta gas condensate field located in OML58 will be developed with a new six-well cluster connected to the existing OBT facilities. Production is expected to start in 2027 with a plateau of 300 million cubic feet per day. The gas will be supplied to the Nigeria LNG plant. The Supreme Court has ruled that banks and financial institutions in Kenya must obtain approval from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance before increasing interest rates on loans and facilities. This decision came as a result of a case between Stampic Bank and Santa Wells Limited, which clarified the regulatory oversight of lenders in setting interest rates. The dispute revolved around whether banks could unilaterally change interest rates based on their contractual terms or if such changes required regulatory approval. Stambic Bank's appeal and Santa Wells Limited's cross-appeal were both dismissed by the Supreme Court. And finally, the International Finance Corporation, IFC, has announced a risk-sharing facility with Dutch Bank worth up to 215 million euros. This facility aims to provide crucial financing to importers and exporters of essential goods in Africa, particularly in small, fragile and conflict-affected states. The partnership with Dutch Bank hopes to address cash flow limitation issues and enable the bank to continue providing trade financing to African countries. It covers 40 issuing banks across 18 countries, including 14 classified as small, fragile, and or conflict affected. That's a wrap on business news at this time. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fasami Peter. The news continues shortly. Bye for now. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Next is sports. Sports update brought to you by Cornoil. Cornoil, we go. The extra mile. In sport, Lajerus Hodrabita Hodu's world record holder Toby Abuson has been cleared to run at the Paris Olympics after sports top court on Friday dismissed appeals against the decision to clear her of a doping offense. 27 year old Abuson was charged in July 2023 with missing three anti doping tests in a period of 12 months but was cleared of the offense by the disciplinary tribunal. Of the sports governing body World Athletics. However, World Athletics and the World Atidobi Agency WADA appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport CAS against that decision. CAS said in a statement that this panel unanimously acknowledged that the athlete committed two filing failures but did not confirm the existence of a beast test alleged by WA and the WADA. Abuso set the world record of 12.12 seconds in the World Championships in Eugene, Oregon in July 2022 and went on to win the title. World Athletics Anti-Doping Rule says any athlete failing to declare their whereabouts for a doping test on three occasions over a 12-month period is ineligible to compete for two years. A sigh of relief for the Nigerian star. And out of football, President of the Nigerian Football Referees Association, Alaji Sadi Zuberu, has appealed to the Nigerian Football Federation to increase the indemnities for referees and match officials in the domestic leagues. Zuberu, who made the call at the 2024 annual general meeting of the Nigeria Football Referees Association in Yelagua Bayasa State, said this had become imperative given the rising cost of living in the country. While taking the NFF under the leadership of Ibrahim Gusso, 
for the support given to referees and ensuring the payment of match indemnities for referees in the just concluded 2023-24 season. He said there was need to clear all outstanding entitlements to match officials. He also urged all football stakeholders to work towards providing adequate security for all match officials across the country to discharge their duties professionally. And to wrap up sports update, Kenyan Defense Force athlete Zedi Cherotic is set to become the first Kenyan female judoka to compete in the Olympic Games with the judo competition scheduled to start from the 27th of July this year at the Champ de Mar Arena. The International Judo Federation confirmed that participation in a letter written to the National Olympic Committee of Kenya stated that she qualified from the continental qualification which she accumulated 384 points. Cherotic will make her debut on the 1st of August in the heavyweight category elimination round of 64. The Kenya Judo Federation stated Cherotic's qualification was as a result of support from African Judo Federation as well as the international governing body who seconded a Japanese coach, Otashuro Yasuke, to the country for the last two years and has been instrumental in sharpening upcoming judoka skills. Congratulations to Cherotic. And that wraps it up on Sports Update. I'm Favor Itwa. Sports Update, brought to you by Corn Oil. Corn Oil, we go the extra mile. Up next is entertainment. Entertainment news in association with Glow Unlimited. On Entertainment Tonight, the funeral rites of the late Nollywood actor John Okafor, famously known as Mr. Ibu, has begun in his hometown of Amuri Ukwano West local government area of Enugu State. Mr. Ibu passed away in March 2024 due to cardiac arrest in Lagos, complication that arose following the amputation of one of his legs. Born in Enugu, John Okafor rose to fame in 2004 with the movie Mr. Ibu, and throughout his career, he featured in over 200 Nollywood films, Labour Party presidential candidate in 2003 general elections, Peter Obi was also in attendance at the funeral for the late Nollywood veteran actor John Okafor. John Okafor passed away at the age of 62. His legacy in Nigerian cinema and his contributions to the entertainment industry will be remembered fondly. Olamide's surprise release, Ikigai, has broken records on Spotify by becoming the most streamed Nigerian project of 2024 within the first 24 hours of its release, accumulating over 1.8 million streams. The album, which dropped unexpectedly, was warmly received by fans, also achieving significant streaming numbers on other platforms, with 3 million streams on Audio Mac and 1.1 million on Boomplay Music on its first day. Ikigai Volume 1 features seven tracks, each offering unique sounds and collaborations with artists like Fireboy, Lil Kesh, Fields, Young John, and Ashake. That's all on Entertainment Tonight. Entertainment News in association with Glow Unlimited. Away from entertainment, let's take a look at what's trending online as Oloture, The Journey, the sequel to the 2019 film, was released on Netflix today. The film exposes a human trafficking syndicate spanning from West Africa to Europe. This sparked a huge conversation online as Nigerians had a lot to say about the film. Let's take a look at some tweets. At Max Flank, MUFC. Just finished watching Oloture Part 2. Nigeria has come of age in cinema. No Nigerian movie has gripped me in decades than this one. Recommended for all. At Ridunu, I can see why the second part of Oloture took four years. What a masterpiece. At Bright underscore R, every scene in this Oloture series looks realistic. This is not your regular Nigerian movie. Nollywood is really improving. I'm impressed. And that's all on What's Trending.
And that's a wrap on the news tonight. But before we go, another look at some of our top stories. We told you that governors want each state to determine new minimum wage. The CBN governor, Olayemi Kadozo, has declared an end to Naira devaluation panic. Health authorities have confirmed two deaths from cholera outbreak in River State. We also told you that Mauritania's president has promised to respect poll outcome. Don't forget to send in your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. You can also follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can watch us live across these platforms. DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Dakbo Adigboye. Good night.